that this behaves as a front wheel drive car and that is exactly where the defining differences between the 340i and this one are evident because you are largely driving this at about 8 tenths and uh, it exhibits that typical understeery character which the BMW does not it is more oversteery in nature and uh, yeah you can really have a lot of fun with the 340i this is also immensely good fun The A35 has a 2-litre 4-pot engine, does about 300-301 horsepower and 400 newton meter, and that is a very crucial figure. The 400 newton meter of torque that you get in such a small car, that is what really defines the character. The way it drives is determined by that, and uh, you get that instant surge the moment you get on the throttle, and uh, the pull is very linear. But at the same time, the moment you bury your foot into the carpet, it is very addictive as well. The way it gains space. You just have to go through the transmission, bang it a couple of gears down and then floor it. And you'll be able to have an instant smile on your face. Yes, it is debatable that the smile is because of the purity of experience when it comes to AMG because as I said you know if you compare it to the A45 that thing is mental that thing is literally going to eat this up for breakfast but this has more pliancy to it this is uh, something which is more forgivable but at the same time AMGs are always associated with that level of hardcore involvement and that is what the A35 does not really offer. But make no mistake, it does really drive very well and uh, to ensure that it gives you a sense of driving involvement which is more than what your typical A-class limousine is going to be like uh, is the fact that Mercedes AMG have given it some specific tuning and some specific add-ons like there is a shearing plate at the front which adds a little bit more rigidity and lets you have a little bit of play at the front end it's more uh, communicative and there are a couple of diagonal braces at the front as well to reduce torsion and increase stiffness at the front end so in terms of the way this thing dives around corners is extremely intuitive yes it is quite low for our roads and uh, managing some sharp speed breakers will be a little bit of a bother it actually can definitely scrape its belly as well on some slightly tall ones but otherwise the compromise between the chassis stiffness and the level of compression that the suspension offers is actually not too bad The engine crankcase is made of uh, high strength die cast aluminium and the twin scroll turbocharger also has a very unique construction. The housing of the twin scroll turbocharger is divided into two ducts and that overall with the whole exhaust system results in uh, lesser back pressure from the exhaust. And speaking of the exhaust itself, it houses uh, a flap which basically is monitored and uh, or rather governed by what drive mode you're in. So if you're in comfort, it's going to be nice and sedate. It's going to be very balanced acoustics. But the moment you get into Sport or Sport Plus, it's going to open up and give you all the experience that you want from the tailpipe. And it's going to be a little bit more growly in nature. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we have said this time and over again that this four cylinder, two liter engine is actually not too bad. And uh, in the AMG trim, it's also been the most powerful four pot in the world. This engine sends its power to the wheels through a seven speed gearbox, and this one is a dual clutch setup. And inherently, it feels very front wheel driven. 
but the moment the car senses that there is a little bit of a torque compensation that needs to be done then it will send uh, that amount to the rear wheel as well to just balance things out between the two axles so it's really only in very tricky situations that you will ever find yourself gulping down a big lump of scare <laughs> and uh, otherwise it's something that is going to be pretty all right Now the A35 also features torque vectoring. It's going to apply the brakes on the inner rear wheel whenever it's stepping out and getting a little jittery around corners. So that is definitely something that's going to keep you in check whenever you're throwing the car around. And uh, this is probably not something that you would want to take for long distance cruising. I'm not saying that you can't do it, but uh, as I said, you know the suspension is okay to live with, but it's not so pliant. that you would want to go on roads that you don't know about one very fun thing in the A35 or any of the performance cars uh, by Mercedes Benz that you will get is this one option called AMG in the menu in the screen it gives you the way the suspension is behaving and uh, then it gives you a g meter so you can have your lateral g's measured along with the input of throttle and then braking performance as well based on a vertical chart and then uh, there is another option which is uh, named engine that gives you a graphic of how much horsepower and how much torque are you consuming and then is the consumption which basically gives you a chart of how much of a fuel have you consumed or burned by your throttle applications In terms of the cabin that's where it kind of suffers because it's a small car if you're sitting in the front absolutely no problem at all the seats are pretty good they hold you in place as well and because this is an AMG you have that whole AMG treatment the cabin is all dark uh, while the regular A class limousine you get uh, a dual tone setup and uh, just generally as well it feels pretty good the steering wheel i've said this before as well for the regular a class limousine that for the size of this car the steering wheel feels slightly big in this one it's a flat bottom you have uh, perforated leather around your grips and just generally it's okay yeah but the size is a bit too big space at the back not really the strength of this car and uh, it is expected as well so if you want something that is uh, very good at accommodating four people in comfort with ample amount of space this probably is not the right choice and you would want to look at the option which is the 340 by BMW Now, this being an AMG and things being a lot firmer than the regular A-Class limousine, the interior also suffers with some rattles and some squeaks, which is understandable to a certain extent, but also unforgivable because this is a Mercedes-Benz, and you expect the best of quality in the cabin. Also, yes, generally the cabin is pretty all right; it's made of decent materials. But when you apply stiffer suspension, absolutely crazy dynamics and more involvement to a platform which otherwise is fairly soft and uh, very nice and cushy you will have some sort of things going wrong on the inside and that's exactly what happens over here in the A35 as well In terms of features and equipment you get almost everything it's fairly well loaded so you have the whole net of safety features you have all the connectivity options as well android auto apple carplay everything of that sort and you get this nice big slab of glass with two screens which are very very slick and also very sharp and the best view is when you get into the sport plus mode in comfort the suspension has been okay uh, not 
too bad <laughs> but the moment you get into the sport or the sport plus mode through this toggle switch over here then things become extremely nice and uh, that's when you start to understand that the AMG in this A limousine is basically all about the fettling around that the engineers have done this bright yellow and generally also the design of the car is such that the A catches your eye very properly and it stands out on the road so the design very subjective i think the 340 also looks pretty smart but the color options are not that great and it's uh, a very subdued way of telling people that you're driving a performance uh, sedan this one this shouts it and it shouts it in style as well But specific to the A35, what does this car feel like? Well, this is the A-Class limousine that's been thrown into the foundry. It has been given a little bit of a fire treatment to come out with more performance and a little bit more excitement. And this is a good option in the 50 to 60 lakh bracket. But then it also faces some very stiff and extremely good competition in the form of the 340i. That is right now the default performance sedan in this category. So yes, it's a bit of a thinking game that you have to do, whether you are more of a brand aficionado when it comes to the AMG uh, title, or you would want to go for the BMW one, which is not an M, it is an M performance model. So yeah, you'll be divided over there. This at least has the AMG badge and that itself is something that will put a smile on many, many faces. Last week, we ran a curtain razor sort of a story on the Tata Curve. But this time around, we have a lot more details packed into the next package that we have coming up. This is about the next crossover, which is going to be all electric by Tata, the curve. Take a look. We often hear that the future of cars is electric. However, if you were to take a look at the current crop of electric cars that are on sale in India, you might think that the future is happening right now. And Tata Motors recently provided us with a glimpse of what it could be like with its latest concept model named the Curve. The electric cars that you can buy in India right now are mostly versions of the already existing internal combustion engine powered cars. So there are some compromises that are made. And here we are specifically talking about the mass segment. Of course, we have some very focused high-end offerings like the Porsche Taycan Audi e-tron, Jaguar I-Pace and the BMW iX. Not so accessible for everyone, right? Now coming back to the mass segment, Tata Curve in its production version could be the first Indian car designed from the ground up to be an electric vehicle in the first place. No surprise that Tata also wishes to bring an IC engine powered or hybrid version based on the concept but the first iteration, which is expected to hit the Indian roads in the next two years, will be an all-electric model. The Indian automaker has not disclosed any details about what kind of powertrain will it boast, but it will be all new and better than the existing Ziptron variants in Tata's EV lineup. The Curve concept also introduces a new second-generation EV platform, which according to Tata, will be able to pack more battery power inside. So another thing that we can expect is a range of about 400 to 500 kilometers on a single charge. Aerodynamics play a huge role in the efficiency of an EV and that has been taken care of very well in the Curve concept. The coupe-like SUV body of the Curve features a number of aerodynamic elements like front air channeling through the bonnet and the C-pillar spoilers. It features a neat and clean design with some strong character lines and all LED lighting. The interior has also been kept minimalistic and another interesting thing is it uses a lot of recycled and sustainable materials. Designed for the future, the Tata Curve features everything digital inside, be it the instrument cluster of the central console or even the remotely operated electric doors. 
However, 2024 looks quite far away and the future car that will be based on the curve is expected to accommodate lots of practical changes. Ask any supercar or sports car fanatic and they will tell you that they prefer rear drive format and more power. That's exactly what Lamborghini has done with its latest model, the Huracan Technica. It drives power from the SQ model and the drive goes to the rear. This promises to be one hell of a machine and is going to be available in limited numbers. Towards an electrified future, Lamborghini's latest offering is in some ways reassuringly old school with the new Huracan Technica sports car. Based on the rear wheel drive Huracan Evo, the Huracan Technica is powered by the range topping STO's 5.2 litre naturally aspirated V10 engine. Tuned to offer 631 horsepower and 565 Newton meter of torque, the Huracan Technica claims a 0 to 100 km per hour sprint time of 3.2 seconds before reaching a top speed of 325 km per hour. The highlight of the new model is a recalibrated Lamborghini Dynamica Vecolo Integrata driving mode that manages the Technica's rear wheel steering and torque vectoring system. As per Lamborghini, it contributes to the maximum driving fun and then there is a modified performance traction control system and the different damper mode specific to Technica. The Italian automaker says that the new sports car has been designed to offer driving fun and lifestyle perfection on both the road and the track. Any automobile needs to be weatherproof and that is exactly why manufacturers spend a lot of time and money in weather testing their cars in extreme conditions whether it's plus 50 degrees or whether it's minus 20, 25, 30 degrees. That is exactly what Rimac is doing with the Nevera in the cold conditions of Sweden, testing the car out in minus 15 or minus 20 degrees Celsius to see whether this product can hold up. Take a look. Rimac Nevera is the world's fastest accelerating electric car, but that's proven only in ideal grip conditions. However, it also needs to function well in extreme weather instances. Which is why Rimac took the Nevera out to Pirelli's Soto Zero Center in Sweden to run some daunting cold weather testing. If you're not familiar with the Nevera, it's Rimac's $2.2 million all-electric hypercar that boasts of a production run of a mere 150 units. Its 0 to 100 km per hour sprint time is just 1.97 seconds thanks to its 1,914 horsepower emitted by four electric motors. The cold weather tests were conducted to ensure the RIMAC team would fine-tune all the control systems in the Nevera before the deliveries of production EVs to customers. Just to make sure that its ABS electronic stability program, torque vectoring and the Pirelli P0 winter tyres can withstand the cold temperatures of around minus 15 degrees Celsius. And we can see the Rimac Nevera gorgeously carving its way through the snow. And it's time to end this episode with that. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to connect with us, just go on any of these social media pages and drop in a line to us. Before going, as always, I urge you to be very, very responsible whenever you're on the road, feet on feet or on wheels. My name is Ashish, signing off. I will see you in 7. Take care. Bye-bye. One World Trade Center that is the one.
claims to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Hopping to a Taliban has gone out. 90 hours of non stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. The biggest team of reporters on ground. Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched the world's biggest vaccination drive. India will have nearly 120 million doses. We know that our shared planet is changing for the worse. We need constructive dialogue. It's time, it's time, it's time. Protests like these are now a frequent hit. A friendship that has stood the test of time. The hyphenating geopolitical equation and focusing on bilateral issues. Site of the opening battle. As you can see uh, the reserve forces are getting ready, they're picking up the weapons here. Ringside Ukrainian military drills. The Ukraine conflict is intensified. Weon brings you all sides of the story. The reserve forces are one of the many protest marches. It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5.30 p.m. IST. How to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. Show us your trustworthiness. Show us your honesty. Prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. God 
Help us. Welcome back and thank you very much for staying with us. Welcome to this edition of We On Wild As One. My name is Eric Njoka. Let's begin with the top stories. Russian offensive targeting Ukrainian cities continues. Series of strikes in northeastern city of Kharkiv leaves at least five dead and 13 injured. Russian strikes ignite fire in several buildings in the city. Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem continues to remain a flashpoint. Tensions continue as firework hurling protesters faced off with Israeli forces carrying out another raid. Ten people have been injured and nine others were arrested so far. Tensions simmer between neighbors Pakistan and Afghanistan over cross-border attacks. Afghanistan says 47 killed in Pakistan strikes, while Islamabad reports a rise in cross-border terror attacks from Afghanistan. <laughs> Protests against Sri Lankan President Gotabaya Rajapaksa grows. Hundreds of demonstrators begin three-day march from southern Sri Lankan city of Beruwala to Colombo against the government's handling of a devastating economic crisis. Residents line up for COVID-19 tests in empty streets of Shanghai as China's financial hub continues to remain locked down for the 17th day with coronavirus cases surging. Over 400 killed and thousands left homeless due to floods in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. Authorities hunt for the missing as more rain is expected. And French far-right presidential candidate Marine Le Pen hits back at rival Emmanuel Macron as the election race hits up. Le Pen denies being a climate skeptic after accusations by Macron. The political drama in Pakistan is far from over. With a new day comes a new twist. With both the government and the opposition trading charges, the most recent one comes from the newly sworn in Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif. He has accused his predecessor and the ousted Prime Minister Imran Khan of misusing the Toshakana or the state depository. Shehbaz Sharif claims that Imran Khan sold expensive gifts received from foreign states in Dubai, including a wristwatch by Saudi Arabia. The BMLN accuses Imran Khan of selling state gifts worth over $765,000 from the Toshakana in Dubai. Imran Khan's party, the Pakistan Tariqa Insaf, has not yet shared details of gifts received by Imran Khan when he was the premier from foreign heads of states and deposited with the Toshakana. The Islamabad High Court has been hearing a petition filed by a citizen seeking details of the gifts. Now, according to Pakistan's law, precious gifts received from foreign dignitaries are supposed to be deposited with the state treasury. In the case a state official wants to keep the gifts, they have to pay a retainer fee. Earlier, it was 20% of the price, but Khan's government revised it to 50% in 2018.
PTI leaders and Imran Khan's aides have been giving contradictory statements. Earlier, Shakhbaz Gil had claimed that the former premier had not sold any gifts. Former minister Fawad Chaudhry, however, in a statement said that these gifts were purchased by Imran Khan and selling one's own assets after purchasing them from the Toshakana is not a crime. Imran Khan received 58 gifts in all, worth over $765,000 from world leaders during his three and a half year stint. Reports say he retained all of them either by paying a negligible amount or even without any payment. Sources say Imran Khan paid nearly $207,000 for gifts valued over $765,000 and other gifts worth over $4,300 were retained without payment. Shebaz Sharif says the most expensive among them was sold in Dubai. Gifts received by Imran Khan include graph watch worth over $464,000, cufflinks worth $31,000, a pen worth over $8,000, and a ring worth $114,000. Their price assessment was made by the evaluation committee set up by Imran Khan. Shebaz Sharif says these gifts were allegedly sold in Dubai, earning over $2,030,000. The list, though, does not end here. Imran Khan has also been accused of retaining other gifts, including several Rolex watches, jewellery, dinner sets, iPhone, bags, and even table mats. The Toshakana case has been pending against Imran Khan in the Islamabad High Court for seven months. The Shehbaz Sharif government has raked up the matter again to further corner the ousted Prime Minister and to possibly counter PTI's corruption allegations against the PMLN leaders. As both the government and the opposition prepare for a fresh political battle that Pakistan could face in terms of by-elections and national elections due next year. Well, for more insight on this controversy, senior journalist Omer Altaf is joining us from Islamabad. Altaf, thank you for making time and welcome to We On. Thank you for having me. Why are these uh, uh, revelations being made now and at this early stage of Sharif's premiership? I think obviously with Imran Khan uh, rallying supporters all across the country, the regime uh, installed in Islamabad has to come up with something to prove that Imran Khan's uh, rule was marred by corruption and misuse of authority. And this is something which they have come... Uh, with still official documents and evidence needs to be released which uh, could uh, point out that Imran Khan didn't follow the procedure in accepting and disposing of the gifts he received from foreign dig dignitaries. And let me tell you, Imran Khan is someone who politicized this issue while he was in opposition and uh, he was saying that uh, uh, the, the governments, the prime ministers and presidents particularly Asif Ali Zardari and uh, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif uh, didn't even report the gifts and presents they received from foreign dignitaries to the Tosha Khana and took them without even reporting it. But it seems in this case that Imran Khan um, uh, was able to dispose of these gifts received. That's the allegation. Uh, by the current Prime Minister that Imran Khan was able to dispose of these uh, gifts uh, uh, and he acquired them at a value far less than 50% of the total value of these gifts. So that, if th this allegation comes true, it would, it would really chip off at the credibility and integrity of former Prime Minister Imran Khan who was very vocal mm -hmm. about uh, transparency as far as Tosha Khana is concerned. Let, uh, and also let me tell you that cabinet division uh, uh, maintains the records of Tosha Khana uh, in Pakistan. And uh, if Shabazz Sharif has uh, uh, the documents, uh, he could um, approach the court and uh, there could be a recovery from the prime minister, uh, for, from the ex prime minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan. Right. Uh, it would be interesting to see how this case. Uh, uh, pans out in days to come.
Well, Al Taf, the former Imran Khan government had maintained that the disclosure of any information related to Tosha Hana would jeopardize international ties. How so? I think he meant that certain Gulf countries which, uh, with which Pakistan has friendly ties and even personal ties, they could, uh, they could be uncomfortable if the, this information is released that uh, which country or which head of the state gifted what item. But I think this, this is a very faulty premise. This is something which, which certainly doesn't work. The public needs to know what their leaders are receiving and from which country. Uh, and so obviously these, uh, this, no one is receiving favors in an individual capacity. It is uh, you receive the gifts, gifts because of the position you command. So people have a right to know. Mm -hmm. And information shouldn't be hidden from the public, which elects the, the prime minister and the head of the state as well. So that's not a very convincing argument as well. And Imran Khan came up with his government, uh, came up with that argument in the Islamabad High Court. The case is ongoing. Let's see how now the, with a the new government in uh, place, how this case would uh, continue in days to come. Yes, and you're right. This investigation is currently ongoing. Let's uh, expound more on that. And federal investigators have launched an inquiry into the allegations against former Prime Minister Imran Khan. But PTI maintains that this information is meant to discredit uh, Imran Khan. What impact will this controversy have on the former Prime Minister's image going forward? Uh, Imran Khan uh, claims to be that he is Mr. Clean and the other people who g governed the country like uh, former President Zardari, Nawaz Sharif, who, uh, who are the relics of the past and they, are, they re represent corruption and uh, plundered money. So this could come as a setback, a huge setback, if it is proven that Imran Khan didn't follow the laid down procedures uh, as far as the Tosha Hana was concerned. So, and uh, so that this could dent his credibility to a great deal. But obviously, his supporters won't buy uh, this. They would say that the others are more corrupt and alle similar allegations, and they would also go into try and maybe defend this. this. But I think. If it is proven and if uh, the prime minister of the country is alleging, uh, making uh, uh, certain allegations against an ex-prime minister, he needs to come up with evidence. And then we will see whether it is convincing or whether it can stand in, the, in a court of law or not. All right. Thank you very much. I've been talking to senior journalist Omer Altaf from Islamabad. Thank you very much for your time and for talking to we on today. Thank you. In one of the first few appointments after change in the regime, Pakistan Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif's son, Hamza Sharif, has been elected as the new Chief Minister of Punjab Province. Hamza Sharif is a leader of the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz Party. He was elected as the new Chief Minister of Punjab after securing 197 votes against PMLQ leader Chaudhry Parvez Elahi. The vote was held in the Provincial Assembly of Punjab amid chaos. The Pakistan Tariqa Insaf Party boycotted the polls, due to which Hamza's rival, Pavez Elahi, did not get any votes. However, they manhandled Deputy Speaker Dost Muhammad Mazari due to the rockers, a contingent of police officers, entered the assembly in civilian clothes. The speaker's seat was also cordoned off by police. Both the parties chanted slogans while PTI members were even seen throwing pictures at the opposition benches. The verbal brawl led to fights on the floor of the house.
Acting Speaker Sardar Dost Mohammed Mazari was moved to his chamber by assembly guards as he announced the victory of Hamza from the official gallery. Mazari also announced that Hamza's rival Pervez Elahi had not received a single vote. Elahi later declared the polls as illegal. Taken to Twitter, Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif declared the violence inside the assembly fascism. He also condemned the attack on the Deputy Speaker Shehbaz also congratulated his son for the appointment. PMLN Vice President Mariam Nawaz also congratulated her cousin on winning the election. She said that the people would get their due rights as the stolen mandate has been returned. This latest looks like the return of dynasty politics in Pakistan. It is reminiscent of the time when current Premier Shehbaz Sharif's elder brother Nawaz Sharif was at the helm and Shebaz himself was the chief minister of the Punjab province. Amid deteriorating ties between Islamabad and Kabul, Pakistan has now claimed that its security forces are being attacked in cross-border attacks from Afghanistan. This comes a day after Pakistan's purported airstrikes across the border, calling on the Taliban authorities to act against the terrorists. Pakistan's foreign office has said that incidents of attacks have significantly increased along the Pakistan-Afghan border in the last few days. However, it remained tight-lipped on reports of the airstrikes. Meanwhile, Taliban Foreign Minister Amir Khan Mutaki and Deputy Defense Minister Mullah Shirin Akund met to the Pakistani ambassador on Saturday to discuss the incident. Foreign Ministry in its official statement said that all military violations must be prevented as such acts can deteriorate relations between the two countries. According to Director of Information and Culture of Afghanistan's coast province, at least 47 civilians have been killed in alleged rocket attacks by the Pakistani forces. Officials of the coast province say that the Pakistani aircraft bombed the Pesa Mila and Mir Safar areas of the province on Friday night. The attack came just hours after at least seven Pakistani soldiers were killed in an ambush near the Afghan border in Pakistan's north Waziristan region. The region which falls in Hyber Pakhtunkhwa has been a former stronghold of terror group Pakistani Taliban or the TTP. Though separate due to ideologies, the Afghan Taliban and the TTP are close allies. Over the years, leaders of Pakistani Taliban have sought refuge across the border in Afghanistan to escape from authorities. Before the Afghan Taliban returned to power last year, Afghanistan and Pakistan have often traded blames, accusing each other of sheltering terrorists in their territories. As France votes to elect a new president, it's Macron versus Le Pen again. Macron, Le Pen, advanced to April 24th runoff. Pro-European economic liberal versus far-right nationalist. Will Macron win a second term? Or will France choose its first woman leader? We on get you ground reports from Paris. French election 2022. We are continuous coverage. Incumbent French President Emmanuel Macron had had a delayed start on the campaigning road. He was juggling between a war in Europe and an election at home. But as domestic issues took the center stage, Macron bounced back to his 2017 self full of energy and promises. In the latest, he visited a city in southeastern France where he pledged to make ecological planning a priority. In fact, his prime minister will be directly in charge of this. Et donc, pour placer l'écologie au cœur du nouveau paradigme politique, comme au 19e siècle, où face au défi éducatif, Jules Ferry était à la fois président du Conseil et ministre de l'Instruction publique. Mon prochain Premier ministre sera directement chargé de la planification écologique.
Meanwhile, EU's anti-fraud body has accused Marine Le Pen of embezzling close to 650,000 US dollars. It is being said that the far-right candidate and her associates have committed two faults. One, used political funds for personal expenses. Two, benefited companies close to her party. Her lawyer has already dismissed the accusations and also raised suspicions over the timing of the report. These developments are affecting the opinion polls. Emmanuel Macron is on course to win the second round. According to data by YouGov, he is currently being backed by 54% votes and Marine Le Pen is trailing behind with 46%. The gap between the candidates has increased by six points. Reports show that 90% of first-round voters are going to vote the same way in the second round. Just 2% is expected to switch. With centrist and far-right candidates on the final stage, left-wing voters have become crucial in this year's election. An internal consultation predicts that supporters of far-left candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon are prepared to abstain from voting on April 24th. The results were published earlier today. Around 215,000 people participated. Among them, 66% are ready to abstain or leave the ballot paper blank. Around 33% are likely to vote for Emmanuel Macron. Far-right candidate Marine Le Pen was not an option for the respondents in this consultation. Africa's video game scene was long bugged by poor internet and equipment. But with improved gadgets and faster internet, Africa's gaming market is on the brink of a boom. Gaming heavyweights across the world are now eyeing the African market, expecting huge revenues from the continent. Here now is a report. I can't lose this. It is just the beginning for video gaming in Africa. Gamers have more than doubled in recent years. The market's untapped potential is immense, with many expecting it to explode as the continent produces more content. Until recently, gamers mostly came from the United States, Europe and Japan. But a shift is underway. There is a big market waiting to be tapped according to South African developer Alexander Poon. We, for example, in South Africa have 11 different languages. That's, that's one thing. Each of them are linked to a specific culture that has different histories. Playing with that in game development as a means to telling a story, it allows you to actually get quite a lot of content that is new and not been fully explored yet. Developers met at Africa's largest gathering for gaming in Cape Town earlier this year. We've got a, a lot of those publishers who are coming here, they want African-made content, um, and so there's a huge opportunity. Now is kind of the best time really to be making games or trying to get into the games industry because we're hoping in the next few years we're going to see a massive spike in growth. Poor infrastructure and low connectivity have held back gaming on the continent. But internet speeds and access are improving. Equipment is cheaper. Central African Tedo Kosoko is paving the way for the new market. Since 2018, he has been creating games that tell the story of Africa. For me, the future of this industry, and not only this industry, is in Africa. It's the new El Dorado. Centuries ago, there was a gold rush in America. Today, I believe this gold rush is happening here on the African continent. And we have to be first. Kosoka moved to France aged 18 to study computer science and management. He started a studio in Toulouse which employs eight people. One of the Maseka Game Studios creations allows players to use avatars of African heroes. Like Burkina Faso's revolutionary leader Thomas Sankara, South African singer Miriam Makeba and George Weah, footballer and former president of Liberia. We must teach young people to love themselves, to value themselves. There is a huge problem with that. And for us, all this is at the heart of our creations. We really want people to deconstruct everything that has been put into their heads, that they are not beautiful, that they are useless. Creators like Kosoko hope their games can eventually compete against those developed by the heavyweights of the sector. 
And on that gamer's note, it's a wrap on this edition of We On Wild As One. Thank you very much for watching. Stay with us. to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Taliban 90 hours of non-stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. The biggest team of reporters on ground. Nearly 120 million doses. We know that our shared planet is changing for the worse. We need constructive dialogue. It's time, it's time, it's time. Protests like these are now a frequent event. A friendship that has stood the test of time. The hyphenating geopolitical equation and focusing on bilateral issues. The place for understanding will be the site of the opening battle. Uh, the reserve forces are getting ready. They're picking up the weapons here. Ringside, Ukrainian military drills. The Ukraine conflict is intensified. We on brings you all sides of the story. The reserve forces One are of the many protest marches.
It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires. Hello and welcome, I'm Ankit Teja and you are watching Tech It Out. This week we review the OnePlus 10 Pro 5G and help you decide if you should buy the latest flagship smartphone. Also our focus is on puppy scams that are targeting pet lovers. Let's get started. The OnePlus 10 Pro 5G is finally here, but the question is, just how exciting is the new phone? And should you buy it? Let's find out. This is the newest OnePlus flagship smartphone, the OnePlus 10 Pro 5G. The phone is loaded with a lot of high-end features. We spent some time with it and here's what we think about it. Now there's a thing about OnePlus. It knows how to make attractive phones with a minimalist design. The OnePlus 10 Pro is the latest example. Packed in an aluminium frame, the phone looks elegant. While the front panel may be mistaken for one on any other high-end Android phone, it's the rear panel that's eye-catching. The redesigned camera system at the back makes it look bold. Covered in ceramic, the rear camera module not only feels premium, but also provides 30% greater resistance against scratches. The slim profile and lightweight design make the phone comfortable to use, even for long hours. Next comes the display. The OnePlus 10 Pro's 6.7-inch QHD Plus display allows the device to adjust its refresh rate between 1Hz and 120Hz. As a result, the OnePlus 10 Pro's display consumes less power than displays fixed at a 90Hz refresh rate. As you would know, a higher refresh rate results in smoother motions and a more fluid user experience. The display is bright and has an excellent color accuracy. Even in direct sunlight, it's viewable. We must say the OnePlus 10 Pro 5G passes the design and display tests with flying colors. Camera is another important factor in a phone. It's time to find out how well the OnePlus 10 Pro's cameras fare. The phone houses a camera system developed in collaboration with Hasselblad, a company known as a premium camera maker. It's credited for its high imaging quality and color performance. The phone has three rear cameras a 48 megapixel main camera, a 50 megapixel ultra wide camera, and an 8 megapixel telephoto camera. The technology and specifications appear to be promising. But does its triple camera system live up to expectations? We put it to different tests, and here are the results. These have been captured in the regular photo mode. Look at how sharp and detailed the close-ups turn out to be. On certain occasions, the autofocus wasn't as fast as we expected. The camera does a good job even in portrait mode. The video stabilization is impressive. This is a time-lapse taken with the phone. We put it to a slow-mo test as well.
It also gets a fisheye mode for clicking wider images. We find this feature a little gimmicky. What we do miss is the macro mode. Though the phone's camera system has many other modes and features that can improve your mobile photography experience. The 32 megapixel front camera is also a good performer. All in all, the OnePlus 10 Pro's camera captures good light, reproduces true to life colors, and produces detailed results. Even in environments with low light, the cameras get a thumbs up. The OnePlus 10 Pro comes with an Android 12 that is customized with Oxygen OS. It is powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 chipset. During most of the tasks, including high intensive ones, the performance is fast and smooth. While there was no lag during the review period, the phone did heat up when used for around an hour on a hot summer day. The OnePlus 10 Pro sports a 5000 mAh battery with 80 watt fast charging. The fully drained battery charges to full in approximately 40 minutes. The battery easily lasts for a day. The OnePlus 10 Pro includes stereo speakers that generate fairly loud audio. The phone is available in two colors, Volcanic Black and Emerald Forest. The variant with 8GB RAM and 128GB storage is priced at 66,999 rupees, which is nearly $880. The other model with 12GB RAM and 256GB storage is priced at 71,999 rupees, which is about $950. Just like all other OnePlus flagship devices, the OnePlus 10 Pro will receive three major Android updates and four years of security updates. Now it's time for the most important question. Should you buy it? The OnePlus 10 Pro 5G is one of the best flagship phones on the market. If you are looking for a high-end Android phone, you must consider it. Cyber frauds are becoming increasingly common. Some miscreants are even exploiting people's desire to bring home a pet. More details in our next report. Are you planning to bring a puppy home? We're here to tell you that you should not buy one online. We say this for two reasons. Firstly, most online puppies are from puppy mills and are sold by irresponsible dog breeders. Secondly, and this reason is the focus of our story today. Puppy scams are becoming more common. Miscreants are exploiting your love for pets. In fact, there has been a significant increase in puppy scams since the COVID-19 pandemic started. According to the Better Business Bureau, in 2021, 35% of all online shopping scams reported to it were pet scams. In the United States, Google sued an alleged puppy scammer who used its services to sell fake pets. This happened after Elder Advocacy Group, AARP, tipped Google about the scam last September. It all started after a South Carolina resident registered a complaint. He had sent $700 in digital gift cards to an online seller for a basset hound puppy that never arrived. Google is seeking monetary damages and a court order banning the accused user from Cameroon. The lawsuit says the puppy scam harmed Google's reputation and the company had to spend over $75,000 to investigate this case. 
Last year, another man from a country in Central Africa pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit wire fraud in a scheme to trick American consumers into paying fee for pets that were never delivered. The victims were induced to make successive payments based on false claims about transportation issues, about the animal needing insurance and other such matters. If you must buy a pet off the internet and are engaging with a breeder or seller online, do keep these things in mind. If the seller is unwilling to send you photos and videos of the puppy or kitten other than what's advertised on their website, it is a red flag. See the pet in person before paying any money. Also, be wary if the price seems too good to be true and the seller insists on getting money up front. Ask for the company name, number and street address. See what Google search results pop up. If you can't find anything, the name and address are probably fake. Lastly, if the seller refuses to speak to you on the phone and prefers to handle communication only by emails, it's most likely a scam. Pets are not gifts or disposable or returnable items. Getting one is a lifetime commitment. If possible, adopt a stray or one from a local animal shelter. But if you must buy one, then look for a responsible breeder for whom animal well-being is a top priority. We know that electrification is a hot trend in the automotive market. Companies around the world are betting big on electric vehicles. Not surprisingly, some exciting electric cars are being showcased at the 2022 New York International Auto Show. It is more. Electric vehicles are dominating the 2022 New York International Auto Show. One of the top performing EVs at the event is the Hyundai Ioniq 5. The vehicle won the World Car of the Year award. It also bagged the World Electric Car and World Car Design trophies at the show. An all-electric updated SUV Chrysler Airflow and the hybrid Alfa Romeo Tonale also caught the attention of visitors. The Tonale has about 30 miles of electric range before switching to gas. It's no secret that companies and buyers are going to electric for a variety of reasons. Well, one of the big things that's happening is sort of a general move towards electrification, it's better for the planet, that kind of thing, but also there's a real spike in consumer interest in electric cars right now because of rising gas prices, with an average price of over $4 a gallon in the United States right now. Um, at Cox Automotive, we saw a 69% jump in interest in electric cars in March versus January, so people are really looking at their options so they don't have to uh, burn down their entire budgets on gasoline. Another thing we see at the New York Auto Show is that there are a lot of electric car startups. Each one of them is trying to establish itself as a unique entity and has come up with all sorts of gimmicks. One of them is Indy EV, and they've got um, a focus on gaming. They've got a supercomputer under the hood that you can use for gaming purposes. Um, whether that's really relevant to car shoppers or just a gimmick um, that entices investors remains to be seen. One thing we have seen, though, is it is very, very hard to build a car and sell it to the public, but it's very, very easy to build a concept and uh, build some hype. So I guess we'll see uh, how many of the car makers here actually go to production. The ongoing 2022 New York International Auto Show will end on April 24th. Apple has confirmed that it will start making the iPhone 13 in India. New robots now claim to treat brain disorders. The week gone by was buzzing with a lot of exciting tech developments and we bring you the most interesting ones in our tech wrap. Apple has started making the iPhone 13 in India. The phone is being produced at a local plant of Apple's Taiwanese contract manufacturer Foxconn. It's situated in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Apple has been shifting some areas of iPhone production from China to other markets including India. 
developing nations like India, Mexico and Vietnam are becoming increasingly important to contract manufacturers as American brands are trying to diversify production away from China. The iPhone 13 is the fourth model to be produced locally after Apple launched manufacturing operations in India in 2017 with the iPhone SE. Look at this, a floating solar power plant built on a quarry lake in Germany. The photovoltaic plant will be able to provide 3 megawatts of power, which is equivalent to a typical onshore wind turbine. It comes as Germany scrambles to find alternative sources of energy and phase out its reliance on Russian oil and gas in the wake of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. This renewable technology could help wean Germany off Russian fossil fuels. These floating panels will save 1,100 tons of carbon dioxide emissions a year, compared with the same amount of power produced from fossil fuels. The plant, with 5,800 modules on 360 floating elements, will go into service on the 24th of May. The all-new electric powerboat race series E1 has begun testing its innovative electric foiling race boat in northern Italy. E1 series is a new championship, a championship of electric powerboats. Electric powerboats that we will race all over the world in different areas, in lakes, in rivers, maybe in the sea also in some areas, to uh, transform uh, marine mobility into electric, to decarbonize uh, the water. The debut season of the E1 World Championship is scheduled to get underway in early 2023. Up to 12 teams and 24 pilots will compete in identical power boats. Spotify Technology has rebranded its live audio streaming service to Spotify Live. Rolled out in June 2021 as Spotify Greenroom, the service will be available as a standalone app and as a live stream function on the main Spotify app. The company has also announced a slew of new content by top artists as it doubles down on the format at a time when virtual events continue to attract audiences. Amazon workers happen to be a third of U.S. warehouse employees. And you would be shocked to know that in 2021, they suffered 49% of the injuries for the entire warehouse industry. This has been reported by the Advocacy Group Strategic Organizing Center. It's been found that Amazon workers are twice as likely to be seriously injured than people who work in warehouses for other companies. The report considers serious injuries to be ones where workers either have to take time off to recover or have their workloads reduced. The report also states that Amazon workers take longer to recover from injuries than employees at other companies. According to Amazon employees, it's not the work itself that's particularly dangerous, but rather the grueling pace the company's automated systems demand. What has long been the stuff of science fiction could soon become reality. California-based startup Bionaut Labs is planning to send miniature robots deep inside the human skull to treat brain disorders. What we're offering is an elegant solution at the source, right? The Bionaut travels to the cyst, fenestrates it, makes a hole once, twice, multiple times, brought out, and the cyst deflates, meaning the pressure is restored in directly at the place where the problem was uh, created. 
The firm Bionaut Labs plans its first clinical trials on humans in just two years. What the micro-robotic technology, the Bionaut, does, it allows you to reach targets you were not able to reach and reaching them repeatedly in the safest trajectory possible. Unlike magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, Bionaut's apparatus is easily transportable. It's also more energy efficient, using 10 to 100 times less electricity. Social media platforms like Instagram and TikTok are flooded with skincare gadgets. One such device is the new body massage gun by TheraBody. Called the TheraFace Pro, this facial massage gun can deliver microcurrent and light therapy with interchangeable magnetic attachments. The device can be used as a deep cleansing tool to remove dirt, oil and debris. It's priced at $399. Well, that's all we have for you in this episode of Tech It Out. We will continue to bring you exciting inventions and updates on the latest gadgets. I will be back soon. Until then, keep watching Beyond World is One. And yes, don't forget to follow us on social media. For now, it's me, Anki Tuteja, signing off. to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Taliban 90 hours of non-stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. The biggest team of reporters on ground. Nearly 120 million doses. We know that our
shared planet is changing for the worse. We need constructive dialogue. It's time, it's time, it's time. Protests like these are now a frequent event. Friendship that has stood the test of time, the hyphenating geopolitical equation, and focusing on bilateral issues. Place where I'm standing will be the site of the opening battle. As you can see, uh, the reserve forces are getting ready, they're picking up the weapons here. Ringside Ukrainian military drills. Ukraine conflict is intensified. We on brings you all sides of the story. The reserve forces are one of the many protest marches. It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5.30 p.m. IST. How to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up an, a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. Show us your trustworthiness. Show us your honesty. Prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. God help us. One trillion species, 7.8 billion humans, 1.9 million species extinct, one planet. Where are we heading? What should we do? Watch Climate Tracker only on Wheel. World is one.
This broadcast on WeOn is coming to you live and direct from Durban, South Africa. Good evening and a very warm welcome. You're watching We On World as One with me, Alison Lagrange, coming to you live from Durban, South Africa. Let's start with your headlines. Russian offensive targeting Ukrainian cities continues. Series of strikes in northeastern city of Kharkiv leaves at least five dead and 13 others injured. Russian strikes ignite fire in several buildings in the city. Ukrainian soldiers ignore Russia's surrender ultimatum and continue to hold the defense in the port city of Mariupol. Russian Defense Ministry says it had offered Ukraine to lay down arms in order to save lives. Russian forces continue to pound areas around the Ukrainian capital. Kiev mayor says fresh missile attacks by Russia damaged a number of facilities around Kiev. Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem continues to remain a flashpoint. Tensions continue as a firework hurling protesters faced off with Israeli forces carrying out another raid. Ten people have been injured and nine others have been arrested so far. Protests against Sri Lankan President Rajapaksa grow. Hundreds of demonstrators begin three-day march from southern Sri Lanka city of Berawala to Colombo against the government's handling of a devastating economic crisis. Residents line up for COVID-19 tests in empty streets of Shanghai as China's financial hub continues to remain locked down for the 17th day with coronavirus cases surging. Queen Elizabeth misses the traditional royal event of Easter service as the monarch continues to face issues related to her health. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, William and Kate, attend the service. Hello and welcome. Let's take a look at our top story. On Thursday, Russia's leading warship sank in the Black Sea. The guided missile cruiser Moskva had been leading Russia's naval effort against Ukraine in the seven-week conflict. But now there are discrepancies emerging on exactly how Russia's prized flagship Moskva sank. Now, Ukraine claims that it hit Moskva with missiles that caused the Russian 510-crew missile cruiser to sink. However, Russia asserts that the ship lost balance in rough seas. It further maintains that the cruiser was damaged due to exploding ammunition and supporting Ukraine's account. The United States on Friday said that the Russian guided missile cruiser was hit by two Neptune missiles, causing it to catch fire and sink in the Black Sea. Now, Ukraine's security and defense forces also confirmed on Russia's key warship Moskva being hit by a Ukrainian missile. Indeed, there was an operation and attack carried out against a group of ships. Indeed, the flagship of Russian Black Sea Navy Moskva was hit. This is very symbolic. The fact that the ammunition detonated once again shows that they are loaded with arms to keep destroying and destroying Ukraine. But the armed forces of Ukraine are ready and what has been done is very symbolic. Now, what is interesting is that despite Russia denying claims by Ukraine, Moscow pounded a Ukrainian rocket factory near Kiev's international airport, 
which produced Neptune cruise missiles. The same projectile that was used to sink the Moscow warship. Now, uh, Russia had earlier tried to downplay the damage and it claimed that Moscow was still afloat. It had also announced that uh, all of the crew on the cruiser had been evacuated onto other Black Sea fleet vessels. In the latest, the Russian Defense Ministry has released a 26-second video of what it says is the crew of the warship of Moscow. The visuals on your screen show a large group of sailors on parade in the Crimean port city of Sevastopol, where they met the head of the Russian Navy. However, it is not clear when the meeting took place. Now, according to Moscow, all 500 crew on board were rescued, but Ukraine claims that the missile that it fired killed the ship's captain, including all the 510 crew members. The United States also believes that there were Russian casualties. Meanwhile, amidst the conflicting reports regarding the sinking of the Moskva warship, a mourning ceremony was held for Moskva and its sailors in Sevastopol. The relatives of the doomed crew of Russia's Black Sea flagship have uh, defied Russian censors and held an unofficial memorial Local residents came to lay flowers at a monument to the, ni to the uh, 1696 foundation of the Russian Navy. A wreath was also placed by a Black Fleet statue, which read, and I quote, to the ship and its sailors. <laughs> Ukraine's... Uh, Invasion has uh, been ongoing by Russia for 52 days, and the assault on major Ukrainian cities is only intensifying. In a series of strikes, Russia has attacked Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv, killing at least five people and injuring 13 others. The visuals on your screen show firefighters battling a blaze in a residential building in Kharkiv following a strike in the center of the Ukrainian city. Now, earlier in the day, Russia attacked another Ukrainian city, a missile attack in the early hours of Sunday, damaged infrastructure in the city of Brovary, near Ukrainian capital Kiev. Now, the mayor of Brovary, Igor Zapogosko, has uh, in an online post highlighted the aftermath of the attack and further warned residents not to go out of the city. Самого ранку були потрапляння в ряд інфраструктурних об'єктів в нашій громаді. Прошу зберігати спокій, можливі перебої з електроенергією, водопостачанням, каналізуванням. Всі служби працюють в посиленому режимі. Ще раз повторюю, звертаюсь до вас про те, що війна продовжується. Accelerating its attack, Luhansk regional governor said that the Russian shelling in the eastern Ukrainian town of Zolota had uh, killed at least two people and injured four. Earlier, Moscow pounded the Ukrainian rocket factory near Kiev's international airport. Taking onus of the attack, Russia said that it used sea-based long-range missiles to hit the Vizar factory where the plant was situated. Украине. Высокоточным оружием большой дальности воздушного базирования уничтожены производственные корпуса бронетанкового завода в Киеве и цеха ремонта военной техники в Николаеве. The attack on Kyiv's plant has resumed Russia's scattered attacks on Ukraine as Moscow pivots towards mounting a new offensive in the eastern part of Ukraine. With the Russia-Ukraine conflict showing no signs of abating, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has now said that Kiev will stall all negotiation talks with Moscow if the last Ukrainian troops in the besieged port city of Mariupol are killed. The stern warning came amid reports of intensified Russian attacks in Kiev and other cities. The strategic port city in southeastern Ukraine has been among the hardest hit since the invasion. С 
знищення наших всіх хлопців в Маріуполі, те, що вони зараз роблять, остаточно може поставити крапку на будь-яких форматах перемоги. Mariupol residents have borne the brunt of the battle, taking shelter in basements with no basic stables for weeks. The port was encircled by Russian troops soon after the invasion. Russian troops have gradually advanced into the city, but Ukrainian forces continue to fight the advancing troops. Є гуманітарна криза, не вистачення їжі, води, немає медикаментів. Тим не менш, хлопці героїчно захищаються, ми, ми їм вдячні за це. Подяки одній точно замало, і тому розробляються ті чи інші плани і перемовні процеси. Скажу чесно, довіри до російських перемовників щодо Маріуполя, чесно, немає. Meanwhile, Russia had issued a fresh warning asking all Ukrainian soldiers in Mariupol to give up their arms and surrender by 3 a.m. GMT. However, Ukrainian troops in Mariupol have refused to surrender as the Russian deadline has now expired. This comes as Russia's defense ministry said its troops have cleared the urban area of Mariupol and only a small contingent of Ukrainian fighters have remained inside a steel plant in the city. Earlier, Moscow had said that it would scale up its military attacks in and around Kiev in response to Ukraine's alleged strikes on border towns. This came after US-backed Ukraine's claim of hitting Russian warship Moskva in the Black Sea. Russia has now also claimed that it has killed over 23,000 Ukrainian troops and foreign mercenaries during the ongoing special operations. The number of contradict uh, those issued by Kiev, the Ukrainian president had yesterday issued a statement that over 2,500 Ukrainian troops have died so far, adding that over 10,000 had been injured. Now, tensions continue to mount at the Al-Aqsa mosque compound as fresh clashes were reported earlier today. Israeli forces entered the compound as worshippers gathered for morning prayers. Israeli authorities say forces entered the compound to facilitate routine visits by Jews, but protesters had piled up stones and set up barriers, which led to a confrontation. Nine people were arrested and at least 20 were injured. Earlier today, the entrance to the holy compound was surrounded by ambulances, heavily armed police and concrete blocks smashed into small pieces. Israeli forces say Palestinian youths threw rocks at the passing buses in the city, which left at least five Israelis injured. On Friday, Israel police raided the mosque compound and clashed with Palestinians. Thousands gathered to pray in the compound early on Friday morning. Now the police raided in and uh, the visitors were injured with stun grenades, tear gas and rubber bullets. Around 150 were injured in that confrontation. In their statement, the Israeli police said that the Palestinians attacked forces with firecrackers and stones and that the forces intervened only to stop the violence and enable worshippers to leave the place safely. Our main purpose for which we operate is to preserve religious worship for all religions on the Temple Mount. The Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said that the government is working to restore calm on the Temple Mount. Bennett also added that the security forces are ready for any task and any scenario that could emerge. Al-Aqsa Mosque compound is located in the old city of Jerusalem. For years, it has been an epicenter of Israel-Palestine clashes. The compound encloses both the Dome of the Barak, the Jews, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. Worship at the holy site is regulated by the police. The point of contention emerged as the Muslim holy month of Ramzan, coinciding with the Jewish celebration of Passover this year. Now, last year, during this time, similar clashes ignited an 11-day war with Hamas militants in the Gaza Strip.
Moving on now, Twitter has been in the news a lot lately and mostly for the wrong reasons. Since Elon Musk bought stakes in the microblogging website, his spat with Twitter is just getting worse. From owning over 9% of the shares to rejecting a post on the board and then offering to buy the company for $43 billion. Twitter's board members are obviously not impressed. But the world's richest man is not one to give up easily. And he's at it again. One of the Twitterati had shared this. A list of Twitter board members and how much they own in the company. Needless to say, nobody came close to Musk's holdings. Elon Musk replied to the data with this, and I quote, With Jack departing, the Twitter board collectively owns almost no shares. Objectively, their economic interests are simply not aligned with shareholders, end quote. Now, this is bound to cause some stir in the San Francisco headquarters. This comes just a day after Twitter announced a poison pill plan with one aim, to make it harder for people like Elon Musk to get a controlling stake. The plan kicks in if over 15% shares are bought without the director's agreement. The plan will also allow selling shares to other shareholders at a discounted price. Now, this eventually dilutes the holdings of new investors. The bid by Musk to buy the company sent shockwaves through the tech world. But at this point, Elon Musk's proposed buyout faces three hazards. One, a possible rejection. Two, assembling the money. And three, a major transformation of the social media giant because Musk has plans to make the company private. Now, two weeks ago, Elon Musk announced his over 9% stake in the company. He is the second largest shareholder after mutual fund giant Vanguard, which holds 10.3% stake. Morgan Stanley is another heavyweight, which has 8.4% stake. BlackRock Inc. owns a 6.5% stake. And State Street Corp., another investment firm, owns 4.5% of Twitter. There is also Saudi Prince Al Walid bin Talal, who has 5.2% holding in Twitter. Now, believers across the world are celebrating Easter, the day on which Jesus Christ was resurrected. From the Vatican to war-torn Kiev, Christians are attending Mass without restrictions for the first time since the pandemic began. Take a look. Next is a look at what is trending across Weon's social media platforms. 
According to reports, a Spanish village has changed its name to Ukraine in solidarity with the citizens of the Eastern European nation. The village is located in southern Spain and was earlier called the Fuentes de Andalusia. Check out this news on Weon's Instagram. Royal Challengers Bangalore star Dinesh Kartik has responded to a fan's Drove 1000 Kilometers for You banner, which had gone viral on social media. Read more about this story on Weon's Facebook page. Britain's Prince Harry has praised the courage of the Ukraine team at an opening ceremony for the Invictus Games in the Netherlands. Check out this story and other updates on Weon's Twitter. According to media reports, Ukraine's richest man has vowed to rebuild the city of Mariupol. This even as Russian forces continue to pound several Ukrainian cities. Read this news and all other updates on the Russia-Ukraine war on Weon's website. Ever since Elon Musk bought stakes in the microblogging website Twitter, his spat with the board is just getting worse. In the latest, Musk has claimed that Jack Dorsey's departure, the Twitter board collectively owns almost no shares. Check out this story and other such interesting stories on Weon's YouTube page. And that's a wrap on this broadcast. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to We On World is One. Plenty more global news on the other side of this break. Good night. As France votes to elect a new president, it's Macron versus Le Pen again. Macron, Le Pen advanced to April 24th runoff. Pro-European economic liberal versus far-right nationalist. Will Macron win a second term? Et donc, let's go. Or will France choose its first woman leader? The French president has himself admitted that this election... We on get you ground reports from Paris. French election 2022. We on continuous coverage. गया नहीं अभी तक हम्म गाड़ी की सर्विस कब से डी है यार ये थोड़ी जाएंगे कहीं ये तो गाड़ी की सर्विस करवाने के लिए कहीं जाने की जरूरत नहीं है फिर कोई गड़बड़ नहीं है <laughs> गो मैकेनिक पर पाए एक्सपर्ट कार सर्विसेज 50 पॉइंट इंस्पेक्शन और तीन महीने की अनकंडीशनल वारंटी डाउनलोड करें इंडिया का नंबर वन कार सर्विसेज ऐप गो मैकेनिक गो मैकेनिक मुझे कभी नहीं लगता था लोग इस मैच को देख पाएंगे 5G की टेक्नोलॉजी से ये आप तक पहुंच जाएगा उसको मैं शब्दों में बयान नहीं कर सकता आए, मैं यहां आपके सामने खड़ा हूं या शायद हूं ही नहीं Every second the hologram stays on the stage more than 1 gigabits per second of data is being pinged wirelessly this is how people will watch sports in the future. Koi cricket ko is tarah bhi dekh payega ye kabhi socha nahi tha.
Israel claims to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Taliban has 90 hours of non-stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. The biggest team of reporters on ground. Nearly 120 million doses. We know that our shared planet is changing for the worse. We need constructive dialogue. It's time, it's time, it's time. Protests like these are now a frequent event. A friendship that has stood the test of time. The hyphenating geopolitical equation and focusing on bilateral issues. The place where I'm standing will be the site of the opening battle. Uh, the reserve forces are getting ready. They're picking up the weapons here. Ringside, Ukrainian military drills. The Ukraine conflict is intensified. We on brings you all sides of the story. The reserve forces are one of the many protest marches. It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5.30 p.m. IST. Eighty million followers on Twitter, holding 9.2% of microblogging sites common stock. From almost joining the Twitter board, to trolling it right away after refusing to join the board of directors. The man who pushes the boundaries of technology is unpredictable. Among the most well-known billionaires, Elon Musk is undoubtedly also the most controversial. Delayed space programs by SpaceX. Overhyped Hyperloop. Fatal cars of Tesla. Misinformation about COVID-19. 
refusing to block Russian news sources while committing to help Ukraine in any possible way. You name any controversy or any sector, you will find Elon Musk's name attached to it. Elon, do you have any comment? Elon, how will you be defending the charge? There's an old saying, jack of all trades, master of none. Has the richest person in the world proven this wrong? Or has Musk bitten off more than he can chew? On April 4th, it was reported that Elon Musk has agreed to a deal that would see him appointed to Twitter's board of directors and prohibit him from acquiring more than 14.9% of the company. He tweeted, and we quote, Looking forward to working with Parag and Twitter board to make significant improvements to Twitter in coming months. The tweet created an uproar on the social networking site and even among the firm's employees. One employee tweeted, Musk's immediate chilling effect was something that bothered me significantly. Another anonymous employee said, Some people are dusting off their resumes. I don't want to work for somebody like Musk. But just a few days later, on April 10th, Twitter Chief Executive Officer Parag Agrawal tweeted that Musk has turned down their offer to join the board. He did not, however, disclose the reason for the Tesla chief's rejection. But it was a dramatic U-turn, although in a barrage of tweets, Musk suggested numerous ideas for the firm, ranging from removing advertisements to dropping the letter W in the name. So what does Musk's refusal signify? And why was he offered a place on the board of directors in the first place? With over 80 million followers, Elon Musk is one of Twitter's most influential users. It was in January this year that Musk started steadily buying significant quantities of shares in the company, reaching a 5% stake in the company by mid-March. By April, Musk had bought more than 73 million shares, representing a 9.13% passive stake in the company. At the time, his overall shares were valued at $2.64 billion, making Tesla's chief executive Twitter's biggest shareholder. But by April 15th, he lost his top spot as the American investment company Vanguard Group upped their stake and acquired 82.4 million shares, or a 10.3% stake. However, Musk was 11 days late in publicly declaring he had amassed a large stake in Twitter. According to legal experts, that omission may have earned him $156 million. A 50-year-old law requires that investors notify the US Securities and Exchange Commission when they surpass a 5% stake in a company. Musk reached that benchmark on March 14th. But instead of making it public, he continued to buy stock at the price of around $39 per share, bringing his total stake to 9.2%. After his disclosure, Twitter's share price rose roughly 30% and is now above $50 per share. This time around, he has declined the board seat. By not joining the board, Musk is no longer subject to an agreement to keep his stake below 14.9%. We personally think um, he's more likely to, to increase his stake here over time, potentially act as more of an active in an activist role, um, looking to potentially um, influence change, whether it be uh, changing members of the management team over time or you know looking to change uh, change members of the board. But over time, you know clearly um, he didn't want to um, keep that stake under 15% and be a member of that board, and there has to be a reason um, in that. Just days after rejecting a seat on the social media company's board on April 14th, it was reported that Musk has offered to buy Twitter for about $41 billion in cash. 
Interestingly, Musk, who calls himself a free speech absolutist and has been critical of the microblogging site in the past. We ultimately believe this turns from a Cinderella story, which would have been if Musk was in the board, to more of a Game of Thrones. I think Musk potentially could go hostile here, continue to increase his stake, maybe partner with the likes of private equity or others. And this could lead to you know, what could be the ultimate acquisition of Twitter or some four strategic changes, including the board. I think it just came down to Musk was not going to play nice in the sandbox with the Twitter board. Before taking a stake, Musk ran a Twitter poll asking users if they believed Twitter sticks to the principle of free speech. In December, Musk even put out a meme that compared CEO Agraval with Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin and showed Jack Dorsey as a clone associate. A day after becoming the largest shareholder, he launched another poll asking users if they wanted an edit button, a long-awaited feature on which Twitter has been working. The Tesla boss also asked users in a poll if Twitter's headquarters should be converted into a homeless shelter, a plan backed by Amazon's founder Jeff Bezos. He even suggested changes to the Twitter Blue Premium subscription feature, including slashing its price, banning ads and providing a payment option in the cryptocurrency Dogecoin. At one point in time, he even declared he is giving serious thought to building his own social media platform. Look, I think Twitter board looked at everything from Musk tweets and basically said it was unacceptable that he needed to ultimately, his view of Twitter strategically, need to stay within the board. And I think once they recognized that wasn't going to happen, I mean, this really became a situation that was untenable. And I think that's something that the Twitter board recognized. And I think his tweets over the weekend really showed that this was starting to go off the rails. And you know, I think it ultimately led to the announcement last night that Twitter and board as well as Musk can come to an agreement. Musk has been regularly mixing in inflammatory and controversial statements about issues or other public figures with remarks on Twitter. Let's take a look. From revealing the place from where he often carries out his social media business to selling his products on Twitter, Musk knows how to stir up a storm on social media. The Tesla and SpaceX CEO has been outspoken about the coronavirus crisis since the very beginning. In one of his tweets, he said the coronavirus panic was dumb. If you've ever seen panic buying, this is panic buying at its finest. Everyone is panic buying. Goodness me! In another incident, along with Donald Trump, he endorsed the use of chloroquine to cure COVID-19 infection. We're going to be able to make that drug available almost immediately. And that's where the FDA has been so great. They, uh, they've gone through the approval process. It's been approved. The Silicon Valley billionaire entrepreneur also denounced coronavirus lockdowns and stay-at-home orders, calling them fascist. In April 2020, he tweeted, free America now and give people their freedom back. Last year, during the Taliban's takeover of Kabul, he made headlines again. 
Musk posted this picture where you can see the Taliban huddling around a table without wearing masks. He tweeted this pic and captioned, not one mask, Jesus Christ. He followed this with another tweet, do they even know about the Delta variant? One of his most controversial tweets was this one. Though he deleted it later, we have retrieved that tweet to show what he thought about the 2018 Tham Luang cave rescue mission. On the 23rd of June 2018, 12 members of a junior football association aged 11 to 16 and their 25-year-old assistant coach entered the cave post their football practice session. Shortly afterwards, heavy rainfall partially flooded the cave system, blocking their way out and trapping them in deep waters. They were stuck for 18 days. British caver Vern Unsworth was chosen for the rescue plan. SpaceX chief executive Elon Musk and engineers designed a kid-sized submarine as a backup plan, but Thai authorities decided not to use his submarine. Musk in a now-deleted tweet described Unsworth as a pedo guy. The British caver sought $190 million in damages from the Tesla founder, arguing that the tweet damaged his reputation. But Musk argued that the phrase pedo guy was common in South Africa, where he grew up. His legal team won the case. Musk was born in Pretoria, South Africa. His mother, May Musk, has spoken extensively about escaping domestic abuse and raising three children as a single mother. Interestingly, when Musk was a child, his adenoids were removed. Because as a child, he often gazed into the distance while his parents were speaking to him. This made them believe that he might be deaf, but nothing changed even after the operation. Elon's parents later got divorced. At the age of 10, Musk developed an interest in computing and video games. Soon after, he sold the code for Blastar for $500. As a 19-year-old, Elon Musk moved from South Africa to Canada, hoping to one day emigrate to the United States. He studied at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, before being transferred to the University of Pennsylvania on a scholarship. In 1995, he graduated with dual degrees in economics and physics. Musk had to overcome many challenges. He was rejected for a role at Netscape, which led him to start SIP2, the web software company which would go on to make him a millionaire. Musk's personal life has been turbulent too. He has been divorced three times and has seven children. Musk and his girlfriend, Canadian singer Grimes, recently split again after welcoming their second child. Their children are called X Ash A12 Musk and Exa Dark Siderel Musk. Rather unusual names that have raised eyebrows. Does my voice sound familiar? Who am I? This is your dad speaking. <laughs> Last year, Musk revealed that he has Asperger's syndrome on live television. I'm actually making history tonight as the first person with Asperger's to host SNL. Many people on social media questioned his claim. Did you know the character of the dangerous tech CEO, Peter Isherwell, in the Oscar nominated film Don't Look Up, is loosely based on Elon Musk. Points on you and every decision you have made since 1994, Doctor. I, I, I know when you have colon polyps months before your doctor does. You've you got four or five at the moment, actually. You know, they're not to, you know, concerned, but I'd have a checkup as soon as you can. But more importantly than that, much more importantly than that, I know what you are. In 2018, the billionaire caused an uproar when he smoked marijuana during a live interview. Comedian Joe Rogan offered Musk a joint, which he accepted. <laughs> Cannabis is legal for recreational use in California. I mean, it's legal, right? It's totally legal. Okay. How does that work? Do people get upset at you if you do certain things? 
Just uh, tobacco and marijuana in there. That's all it is. The video the went viral, and Tesla shares plummeted more than 9%. A meme fest followed, taking the internet by storm. Clearly, Musk was amused. Three years later, soon after announcing that he was going to be a part of Twitter's board, he tweeted the infamous photo. Captioning the meme, Twitter's next board meeting is gonna be lit. Even though he is not joining the board, his followers can rely on him to stir the pot on Twitter. Have you seen this viral video? The Tesla CEO's awkward dance moves lit up the internet. This is how he celebrated the opening of the company's new Giga factory in Berlin. Musk threw a huge party to inaugurate the manufacturing plant the size of 100 soccer fields in Texas. So what we have here is, uh, if, you put the, if you put the building on its side, but if you put the building on its side, uh, it would, it's taller than the Burj uh, Khalifa. Uh, that's to scale. Uh, it's 80 feet tall. Um, it's uh, <laughs> uh, equivalent to three pentagons. When a building is me measured in units of pentagon, you know it's, uh, it's quite, quite large. And this building is the, the, the most advanced car factory that Earth has ever seen. Those who couldn't get inside the cyber rodeo watched the event from the outside. I flew out from Riverside, California. Uh, it was about a two and a half hour flight. Um, I came to specifically for this Giga Rodeo uh, trip. Um, it was just a thing a lot of people on Twitter were talking about and uh, I'm a big fan of the company, shareholder, product owner, Model Y. Uh, so I came specifically for the Cybertruck. <laughs> That's what I wanted to see. We saw on Twitter and on Where What When Austin that there's going to be some kind of cyber rodeo here tonight. Uh, didn't really do our research, just kind of showed up. And we thought that they weren't going to be strict at the doors, but now we're just waiting outside, not really knowing what to do with our Thursday nights. <laughs> we also just wanted to check it out. This place is huge, yeah. so we wanted to see what it was about. Eight million square feet. We did a little bit of research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In 2020, Tesla became the world's most valuable car maker, overtaking Japan's Toyota. Musk built his electric car company around the promise that it represented the future of driving. But Tesla's self-driving claims are being reviewed over false promotions. The US Auto Safety Agency has opened dozens of investigations into crashes of Tesla vehicles, and families are suing Tesla over fatal crashes. Elon Musk has also come under heavy criticism for some of his space programs. The billionaire SpaceX CEO is launching satellites into orbit and promising to deliver high-speed broadband internet. Satellite internet is beamed through space at a rate that's reportedly 47% faster than fiber optic cable internet. So what's the problem? His satellites are taking too much room up there. SpaceX has launched more than 2,000 satellites and it eventually aims to get nearly 12,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. To put things into perspective, fewer than 9,000 have ever been launched in all of history. In December, China claimed it had two close encounters with Starlink satellites. There are growing concerns about satellite mega constellations littering space with hundreds of dead satellites. Regardless, Musk is now gearing up for his most ambitious project, the colonization of Mars.
Elon Musk wears many hats. His projects and interests are never ending. He's outspoken and brash. He's also used to proving all of his biggest critics wrong. Last year, in a regulatory filing that also appears to celebrate the firm's cryptocurrency investments, Elon Musk crowned himself the Techno King of Tesla. The title is bizarre, but so is the billionaire king of controversy. Welcome to the Cybertruck Unveil. <laughs> अभी तक गाड़ी की सर्विस कब से डी हुआ यार ये थोड़ी जाएंगे कहीं ये तो गाड़ी की सर्विस करवाने के लिए कहीं जाने की जरूरत नहीं है फिर कोई गड़बड़ नहीं है <laughs> गो मैकेनिक पर पाए एक्सपर्ट कार सर्विसेज 50 पॉइंट इंस्पेक्शन और तीन महीने की अनकंडीशनल वारंटी डाउनलोड करें इंडिया का नंबर वन कार सर्विस ऐप गो मैकेनिक गो मैकेनिक मुझे कभी नहीं लगता था लोग इस मैच को देख पाएंगे 5G की टेक्नोलॉजी से ये आप तक पहुंच जाएगा उसको मैं शब्दों में बयान नहीं कर सकता मैं यहाँ आपके सामने खड़ा हूँ या शायद हु ही नहीं Every second the hologram stays on the stage. More than वन gigabits per second of data is being pinged wirelessly. This is how people will watch sports in the future. कोई क्रिकेट को इस तरह भी देख पाएगा ये कभी सोचा नहीं था to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Hopping to a Taliban headquarters. 90 hours of non-stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. 
biggest team of reporters on ground. We know that our shared planet is changing for the worse. We need constructive dialogue. It's time, it's time, it's time. Protests like these are now a frequent event. A friendship that has stood the test of time. The hyphenating geopolitical equation and focusing on bilateral issues. Place for understanding will be the site of the opening battle. As you can see, uh, the reserve forces are getting ready, they're picking up the weapons here. Ringside Ukrainian military drills. Ukraine conflict is intensified. We on brings you all sides of the story. The reserve forces are One of the many protest marches. It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5.30 p.m. IST. how to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. Show us your trustworthiness. Show us your honesty. Prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. God help us. Thank you very much for staying tuned. You are watching We On Wild is One. Welcome back and thank you very much for joining us at this hour. My name is Eric Njoka. Ahead on Today Tonight. Sources say Shanghai has set a target to stop the spread of COVID-19 infections outside of quarantined areas by Wednesday. The plan would allow the city to further ease lockdown and return to normal life.
Tensions simmer between neighbors Pakistan and Afghanistan over cross-border attacks. Afghanistan says 47 killed in Pakistan strikes, while Islamabad reports a rise in cross-border terror attacks from Afghanistan. Over 400 killed and thousands left homeless due to floods in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. Authorities hunt for the missing as more rain is expected. Russian offensive targeting Ukrainian cities continues. Series of strikes in northeastern city of Kharkiv leaves at least five dead and 13 injured. Russian strikes ignite fire in several buildings in the city. Russia raises concern over increased NATO activity in the Arctic. Moscow says it sees risks of unintended incidents occurring in the region. French far-right presidential candidate Marine Le Pen hits back at rival Emmanuel Macron as the election race heats up. Le Pen denies being a climate skeptic following accusations by Macron. And Stefano Sissipas battles past Spain's Alejandro Davidovich Fokina to retain the prestigious Monte Carlo Masters title. The Greek wins his first title of the season and eighth overall. Pakistan's incumbent Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has written to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi expressing his desire for better bilateral ties between the two countries. Weon has exclusively accessed details of Shabazz Sharif's letter. In his reply to Prime Minister Modi's congratulatory message on assuming office, Sharif has said that Pakistan remains committed towards maintaining regional peace and security. Sharif has also said that peaceful and cooperative ties are imperative for pro progress of people in both the nations, which can be achieved through dialogue and peaceful resolution of all the outstanding disputes, including the Indian territory of Jammu and Kashmir. Well, for more insight on this, our Pakistan Bureau Chief Anas Malik is joining us live from Islamabad. Good to see you, Anas Malik. Tell us the significance of this gesture by the new Prime Minister and what impact this extension of an olive branch would have on Pakistan and India going forward. Well, Eric, this is absolutely very significant for one very reason. There have been a stalemate in talks between Pakistan and India. All sorts of talks, all sorts of dialogues, all sorts of exchanges. Last such exchange between uh, the Pakistani government, uh, between the civilian leadership rather, took place last year uh, on the occasion of the Pakistan Republic Day when uh, Indian Prime Minister had written to the then Pakistani Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan and Imran Khan had responded by uh, reciprocating a letter as well uh, uh, to the Indian Prime Minister back then and he had again talked about uh, uh, the outstanding issues. Now this letter is a reply to uh, uh, Indian PM Modi's letter to Sh uh, Prime Minister Shabaz Sharif and Prime Minister Shabaz Sharif has said uh, and rather talked about uh, Pakistan's sacrifices in uh, uh, the uh, 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 in the war against terror and how uh, the, the number of casualties Pakistan has had to suffer due to terrorism as well. He said he's talked about meaning meaningful engagement, uh, talked about regional peace and how regional peace is uh, directly uh, 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 subjected to a peace between India and Pakistan and that how uh, going forward uh, Jammu and Kashmir issue uh, is there uh, as well in, in the talks and that has to be talked about as well for a peaceful region. This is what uh, Pakistani Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif has emphasized in his letter. Uh, that is a reply letter to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Now what is to be noted is that PM Modi was the second dignitary 
to uh, uh, congratulate the Pakistani Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif upon his election, the first being uh, uh, the Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And uh, after that, we saw that tweet coming in, which was replied upon uh, by the Pakistani Prime Minister. So some exchanges taking place, lots to do uh, between India and Pakistan. But this letter can definitely be, be seen as a breath of fresh air given the hostility of relations at least on the civilian side that has been that had been persisting uh, given that the previous government was there and the ante was up uh, you know, to the extreme so this letter will definitely be seen as a breath of fresh air eric we'll have to leave it there thank you very much our pakistan bureau chief anas malik for your insights and for talking to us today the Western media is known for peddling narratives, especially when they understand the story only halfway. We are talking about a familiar culprit, the New York Times. This is what their latest headline reads. India is stalling the WHO's efforts to make global COVID death toll public. A very catchy starter. Just one problem. It is half true. The article claims that the World Health Organization is working on a comprehensive report which will provide details on how many people lost their lives to COVID-19. But the New York Times says that the report has been delayed because of India. And that's not all. It has accused the country of hiding numbers. The report reads, the WHO report has been delayed for months because of objections from India, which disputes the calculation of how many of its citizens died and has even tried to keep it from becoming public. So let's give you the full picture. India has not refused to provide the data, but merely raised concerns of how it is calculated. The Indian Health Ministry has released a statement where it clearly mentions that New Delhi had conveyed its concerns to the WHO on six separate occasions. But it is still waiting to hear back from the WHO. India has objected to WHO's one-size-fit-all approach which basically means that the model for smaller countries like Qatar is the same for larger countries like India. The size here refers to both geographically and population-wise. The global health body has relied on government as well as date or data by local authorities, which is something New Delhi has objected to. India, in its defense, says, and I quote, we believe that in-depth clarity on methodology and clear proof of its validity are crucial for policymakers to feel confident about any use of such data. India has put its death toll from COVID-19 at a little over 500,000. But New York Times report says that WHO's figure is much higher, at 4 million. While the data is still being assessed, it will be wrong to speculate over these sensitive issues. But this is not the first time that New York Times has indulged in biased reporting. Last year in May, they made a similar conjecture. The headline read, just how big could India's true COVID toll be? Remember, this is during the second wave of in India, and the country was battling one of its worst health crises. Now, in a bid to contain the rapid spread of COVID-19 in the financial hub of China, Shanghai, the authorities have set up a target to ramp up mass testing and to immediately transfer positive cases to the quarantine centers. Shanghai has become the epicenter of China's largest outbreak. The city has reported over 23,000 new COVID cases on Saturday, out of which 722 cases were found outside quarantined areas. Besides this, it has recorded more than 320,000 cases since early March. However, Shanghai has new goal of zero COVID at community level by 20th of April. Authorities have pledged to stamp out clusters by conducting tests and by isolating positive cases. This has resulted in strict curbs and has forced residents to stand in long queues for another round of mass testing in their residential compounds. Now, amid the prolonged lockdown, the city faces acute shortage of food and other essential goods, which has sparked anger among the public. Residents have also complained about poor conditions at quarantine centers. Not only this, but as Shanghai remains in strict lockdown, the entire country faces disrupted supply chains and port delays. And with this, the economic woes of the country are set to worsen. Growth in the world's second largest economy was already slowing down as outbreak would revert the gains made early in the year. 
Chinese car makers also warned of severe disruption to supply chains this week. They have even alluded to possible halting of production completely if lockdown in business hub of Shanghai continues. South Asia's debt-ridden nation of Sri Lanka has turned to the International Monetary Fund for a loan. Finance Minister Ali Sabri has headed to Washington, D.C. to hold talks with a global monetary body. The negotiations for an immediate emergency funding comes amid foreign exchange dias in the island country, which is incapable of financing even the most essential imports. The Sri Lankan delegation will be meeting with the IMF from April 19. And the focus of the five-day meeting will be to secure up to four billion U.S. dollars. The delegation also hopes to find other lenders to help the island nation limit its debt defaults. Meanwhile, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka has suspended foreign debt payments and diverted dwindling foreign reserves to importing essentials. Sri Lanka needs between three to four billion dollars this year to pull itself out of an unprecedented economic crisis. The talks are scheduled to begin in Washington on April 19th. If the delegation succeeds in making a decent case before the IMF, the emergency relief funds can be expected within the coming weeks. Citing the economic crisis in the country and rising external funding pressures, multiple ratings agencies have downgraded Sri Lanka's sovereign rating. Fitch downgraded Sri Lanka's foreign currency rating. The credit rating agency says the move reflects its view that a sovereign default process has begun. S&P Global said in a statement, Sri Lanka's debt restructuring process is likely to be complicated and may take months to complete as the government scrambles to secure external assistance. IMF's mission chief for Sri Lanka, Masahiro Nozaki, was reported saying that IMF supported the country's plans to engage with creditors. I quote here, we assessed Sri Lanka's debt to be unsustainable and that the country's fiscal efforts and macroeconomic policy adjustments alone could not restore debt sustainability. IMF extended help to Sri Lanka the last time in 2016. The loan was capped at $1.5 billion, but the program was prematurely terminated after disbursing $1.3 billion. Sri Lanka has also turned to countries like India and China for support amid a weak foreign reserves position. The nation is also in talks with the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank for support. Ahead of the negotiations for a debt restructure with IMF, the cash-strapped country's loss-making national carrier has revealed plans to lease aircrafts. Despite the crisis, state-owned Sri Lankan airlines will expand their fleet from 24 to 35 planes in the next three years. The national carrier did not say how it planned to finance the leases. The plan came the same day Fitch downgraded bonds issued by the airline, suggesting the carrier was near default. Sri Lanka has also announced a five-day share trading halt. Colombo stock exchange officials say they were under pressure not to reopen to prevent an anticipated collapse of the market. Meanwhile, the protesters on ground remain adamant on demanding President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's removal. Demonstrations have raged across Sri Lanka for weeks. People are angered by prolonged power cuts and shortages of fuel and medicine. Citizens have camped outside the presidential secretariat for almost a week now. The first high-profile sports stars to join the demonstrators are Sri Lanka's World Cup winning cricket captain Arjuna Ranatunga and fellow ex-skipper Sanath Jayasuriya. The pair called on other former players to support peaceful protests. Several trade unions also joined the demonstrations, laying siege to President Gotabaya Rajapaksa's seafront office. Thousands of people marched to voice out their anger against the president.
Let's move on to Africa now. Days of torrential rainfall has battered coastal region of South Africa. It has triggered severe floods and mudslides, due to which the death toll has now reached 443, and tens of thousands have been left homeless. Following the devastation, the government has announced $68 million of emergency funding. And due to the ongoing flash floods, which are expected to last for another week, President Cyril Ramaphosa has postponed his visit to Saudi Arabia, which was supposed to begin on 19th of April. This, as the flood water has engulfed, water has engulfed southeastern coastal city of Durban. Heavy downpour has knocked out power lines, shut off water services and disrupted operations. The torrential rain has destroyed several hospitals. It has damaged more than 13,500 homes and at least 40,000 people have left or have been left homeless. Meanwhile, the emergency services in KwaZulu-Natal province remain on high alert. This as at least 443 people have been killed and 27 people are still missing. As of now, South African flood victims have sought shelter and food at community halls. However, the campaigner have called on for greater investments. This is South Africa's east coast has got more vulnerable to floods in the last few years, which have been linked to human emissions of greenhouse gases. And now the people want to be better prepared for worsening climate change. So, God is not to the Alima Lanjal, Gentle or Ebona Galai, Ebekama Idia Lumser. So, Tununga Sayas can go in report by eighteen Milan and SMS country. Pin the put a man's abuse as much. U.S. border authorities have made record number of arrests of migrants. Over 200,000 migrants have been put behind bars. This is the highest monthly tally in two decades. Let's tell you why this happened. When Joe Biden was running for office, he wanted to reverse many of his predecessor Donald Trump's policies. One of them was hardline immigration law. While the rollback was with good intentions, it has backfired. Because many people say that Biden's easing has prompted more illegal immigrations. Last month saw a 24% jump in arrests than the previous year. Thousands of children have been left unaccompanied in crowded border stations. Shelters are already overwhelmed. In the coming weeks, officials are preparing for as many as 18,000 migrants. The situation is only going to get worse. On the 23rd of May, U.S. is expected to end the pandemic-era border restrictions. Most migrants are from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. But recently, many from far-flung places like Ukraine are also knocking on the border gates. In seven months, the United States will hold its midterm elections, and Republicans are eyeing to gain control of the U.S. Congress. Experts say that immigration is expected to be one of their main weapons against Democrats. The Easter holiday is an unusually busy time for farms across England. Traditionally, people flock to the farms during Easter to see newborn animals. Our next story is about a farm in East London that is welcoming people back for Easter after the COVID lockdowns. Take a look. It is springtime in England and one of the most exciting ways of celebrating Easter for both children and adults is a trip to the nearest farm. At the Stepney City Farm in London's Tower Hamlet, Claire Hawkins is feeding the farm animals and is getting them ready for the Easter celebrations. Easter and spring generally is the most exciting time of the year for us. Um, it's the time where we have lambs and goats and chicks on the farm and everybody wants to come and, and visit them. Um, we also have all of the new crops growing on the farm. Um, there's um, lots of colour and uh, the whole place just comes alive in springtime. Spread over three acres in East London, the city farm describes itself as a rural oasis in an urban landscape. It also offers educational programs and is extremely popular with families and children. Especially in a densely populated city like London, the green space of the farm offers a welcome escape. 
I think during the pandemic, we all became more conscious of nature and how essential it is to our well-being and our humanity. And I think that makes places like Vauxhall City Farm, um, all the green spaces in our cities, it makes them makes us more aware of how essential they are and it makes us appreciate them more. But interestingly, it is not just children and families who are heading to the farms for an outing. The pandemic forced most of us to work from our homes. So cooperates are now turning to the lush green spaces offered by the farms for their team outings. So our company's organised volunteering, uh, so we've come out from our company today to help uh, restore the farm's flower beds. Uh, so we're doing this just to uh, show a bit of appreciation for the community, um, but also it's nice team building wise, we're getting to know each other, so we're really enjoying that and it's nice to be out of the office in the fresh air. After having been cooped in their homes due to Covid, it is in farms like these that a lot of corporate workers are meeting their colleagues for the first time. So if you're sitting at home and wondering how best to spend your Easter holiday, a visit to your nearby farm could just be the thing to enjoy the festive mood. Bureau Report, Vion, World is One. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle attended the opening ceremony of the Invictus Games in The Hague. On the occasion, the couple also paid tribute to the Ukrainians. At the Invictus Games opening ceremony, Britain's Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan Markle, paid tribute to the bravery of the Ukrainian athletes. The multi-sport event was started by Harry in 2017 for military personnel wounded in action. During the opening address, Meghan Markle highlighted the efforts of the Ukrainian team. For each team, my husband and I both recognize it's been a lot to get here, both physically and emotionally, not least of which for the Ukraine team, whom we are all standing with. The Duchess of Sussex closed her address with Slava Ukraini, a Ukrainian national salute meaning glory to Ukraine. Harry echoed her sentiments. Look no further than our representation from Team Ukraine. Your bravery in choosing to come and for being here tonight cannot be overstated. You told me yesterday when you decided to join us despite all odds, you said you came to be on this global stage not simply to show your strength but to tell your truth the truth of what is happening in your country. You know we stand with you. The world is united with you, and still, you deserve more. And my hope is that these events, this event, creates opp the opportunity and how, of how we as a global community can better show up for you. The Duke also had personal anecdotes in his speech. He talked about his son, Archie, and how he too dreams of becoming a helicopter pilot sometime. I talked to my son, Archie, about what he wants to be when he grows up. Some days it's an astronaut, other days it's a pilot. A helicopter pilot, obviously. <laughs> or quasi, from Octonauts. If you're laughing, then you've seen it. Harry is a former soldier who had quit the armed forces back in 2015. He had worked the forces for nearly a decade. And that's the latest at this hour. Thank you very much for watching this edition of Today Tonight. My name is Eric Njoka. Bye for now. India's global voice, the channel that brings you the biggest. अरे बयानी अभी तक हम्म गाड़ी की सर्विस कब से डिवे यार ये थोड़ी जाएंगे कई ये तो गाड़ी की सर्विस करवाने के लिए कई जाने की जरूरत नहीं है चल कोई गड़बड़ नहीं है
गो मैकेनिक पर पाए एक्सपर्ट कार सर्विसेज 50 पॉइंट इंस्पेक्शन और तीन महीने की अनकंडीशनल वारंटी डाउनलोड करें इंडिया का नंबर वन कार सर्विसेज ऐप गो मैकेनिक गो मैकेनिक मुझे कभी नहीं लगता था लोग इस मैच को देख पाएंगे 5G की टेक्नोलॉजी से ये आप तक पहुंच जाएगा उसको मैं शब्दों में बयान नहीं कर सकता मैं यहां आपके सामने खड़ा हूं या शायद वो ही नहीं Every second the hologram stays on the stage more than 1 gigabits per second of data is being pinged wirelessly This is how people will watch sports in the future कोई क्रिकेट को इस तरह भी देख पाएगा ये कभी सोचा नहीं था to have destroyed a rocket launching site used by the Hamas. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has made no mention of any halt to the offensive. We at Vion have tracked the story from the word go. Vion reports on the latest health threat before the world. People diagnosed with the coronavirus in Russia may be deported back to their home countries. The looting started early Saturday. South Africa is witnessing riots. Ninety hours of non-stop live broadcast. The most extensive coverage. Biggest team of reporters on ground. Hello and welcome to We on World is One. I'm Radhi Francis and this is the West Asia Post. Today our top story sounds like a deja vu tale. This Ramadan was supposed to be more peaceful. West Asia was marking it without curbs after two whole years. But in Palestine, tensions are escalating. Clashes broke out in the West Bank. Several Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces. Authorities are carrying on more and more raids in the occupied territories after a wave of attacks. So, as the region remains tense, will these tensions escalate into an all-out conflict like last year? We tell you more. Over 16 Palestinians killed 
a wave of attacks in Israel, clashes in the Al-Aqsa compound, and the deadliest wave of violence since 2016. Palestinians and Israelis have witnessed an increase in violence, especially over the past month, and now during Ramzan. Several attackers targeted Israeli cities. Israeli forces stepped up raids. There were shooting and multiple arrests, with Palestinians killed across the West Bank. So far, four attacks took place in four Israeli cities. The attack killed 14 people. On the other hand, Israel increased its raids on Palestinian towns and villages. This led to daily clashes and arrests. Over 16 Palestinians, including teens, have been killed. The rise in violence is not an isolated phenomenon. Palestinians are slamming Israeli policies in occupied territories and lack of any strong leadership. Protests waged in cities across the West Bank, with shops and businesses shuttered in Ramallah. The latest bloodshed coincides with the holy month of Ramzan. For many, this is a deja vu moment. Last year, violent raids on the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound led to this. A deadly 11-day war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza itself. The conflict killed 200 people and battered the Strip. So the biggest question now is, could this lead to an all-out war? More Israeli raids means more uptick of violence, like this one at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. This is where thousands gather to pray at night. This is where the Israeli police clashes with Palestinians, injuring several of them. Israeli police are said to have entered in force before dawn. Over 59 wounded people were evacuated to hospitals. One of the guards at the site was shot in the eye with a rubber bullet. There is now fears of a new conflict between Hamas and Israel. Hamas has called for a Palestinian general mobilization. They are calling on people to confront Israeli incursions. Tensions have been simmering in the holy city of Jerusalem. This year, the Muslim holy month of Ramzan coincides with both the Jewish celebration of Passover and Easter. In focus is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is Islam's third holiest site, a silver-domed mosque inside the 35-acre compound. This complex is referred to as Al-Haram Al-Sharif, or the Noble Sanctuary by Muslims. But the location is also considered holy in Judaism. For Jews, it is known by the name of Temple Mount. Jews believe the compound is where the biblical Jewish temples once stood. Since decades, it has been a flashpoint, the most contested territory in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Currently, Jordan acts as the custodian of Al-Aqsa. This was agreed to by both Israel and Jordan in a peace treaty. They decided that the Islamic Trust would have control over matters inside the compound. On the other hand, Israel would control external security. Non-Muslims would be allowed onto the site during visiting hours, but they would not be allowed to pray there. Recent calls by Israeli settler groups have further escalated tensions. They want Jews to raid the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound, asking them to perform the Passover sacrifice there on April 15th. For Palestinians, this is yet another threat. Yet another Israeli attempt to change the holy site's sensitive status quo. Currently, the situation is gradually towards an escalation. The conditions are ripe for an explosion. Will this lead to an all-out war again? Only time will tell. West Asia Bureau, we own. World is one. From Saudi Arabia to Yemen, Qatar and much more, we have a lot more lined up for you in this edition of the West Asia Post. But first, as usual, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across the region. 
The World Bank says that the war in Ukraine has multiplied risks for West Asia's poorer countries by raising food and energy prices, and has warned of potential social unrest. A new report has revealed that women and children living in refugee camps in northwest Syria are facing chronic and high levels of violence and depression. Some women in the camps are even forced to engage in what is being termed as survival sex. Lebanon's government has agreed to disburse 15 million dollars to temporarily resolve growing bread shortages in the country, but added that the funds would only last a few weeks. Kuwait is experiencing a severe shortage of expat workers in various sectors, especially professionals and craftsmen. This comes as tens of thousands of workers have left the country. Iran is hoping to host World Cup fans after an agreement with Qatar. Tehran is planning to expand air and sea travel while relaxing visa rules during the upcoming World Cup. Saudi Arabia has set the limit of 1 million Hajj pilgrims this year. Riyadh says Muslims from inside and outside the country will be able to perform the Hajj, providing they are fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and no older than 65. It is a war that many have forgotten, but it is a war that remains till date. Yemen's exiled president has transferred power to a new council, one that will take part in the talks with the Houthi rebels. Now this comes as the war in Yemen enters its eighth year. With this new development, talks about peace are gathering pace. Now many are asking, will this finally end the war in Yemen? Let's take a look. The war in Yemen began seven years ago. In 2015, a Saudi-led coalition intervened in the West Asian nation. They supported the government against the Houthi rebels. The Houthis had already seized parts of the country, including the capital. Thus began a bloody conflict that continued for years. What's happening in Yemen is a tit-for-tat war. Strikes followed by retaliatory strikes and then preemptive strikes. All this while civilians on the ground watch on as firepower raises hopes for a better life. This isn't a battle for Yemen anymore. It's a theatre for the West Asian Cold War. A strip of land where Saudi Arabia and Iran can unleash a battle of egos. The Yemenis are merely pawns in this game. They are expendable. The war torn nation is one step away from a famine. The war has killed thousands, injured millions and upended the life of its children, leaving behind a conflict-ridden nation where 80% of the population depends on aid. But now the country could be looking towards some peace. Attempts to end the war appear to be gathering pace. Yemen's exiled president has finally stepped aside, transferring powers to the country's presidential council. President Abd Rabu Mansour Hadi was in exile in Saudi Arabia. This means this presidential council can now lead talks with the Houthi rebels. I'm announcing the founding of a leading presidential council to complete the implementation of transitional periods tasks and I'm transferring all my power to the presidential council in an irrevocable way in accordance to the constitution and the Gulf Initiative's executive mechanism and putting together a committee that includes all the factions to support the leading presidential council in fulfilling their duties. The newly created body consists of a president and seven members. It will lead talks to implement a permanent ceasefire and a political settlement. The announcement follows the start of a two-month ceasefire and a week of discussions in Saudi Arabia on ending the war. 
but the Houthis have rejected Hadi's announcement. However, the new government remains optimistic. The Presidential Leadership Council promises our Yemeni people to put an end to the war and bring justice and comprehensive peace. This council is a peaceful one, but also it's a defensive, powerful council, and it is united too. Its mission is to defend the sovereignty of the homeland and protect its citizens. And protect its citizens. The only question that remains is why would the Houthis take the bait? As for Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, this is his personal battle, one that he pulled his country into years ago. As the war enters its eighth year, will the new development bring an end to this conflict? Only time will tell. West Asia Bureau, Vion, World is One. Saudi Arabia is on a spree to mending ties. First it was Turkey and now it is Lebanon. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has sent back its ambassador to Lebanon. Now, this improvement in relations comes just ahead of May's general elections. We bring you the story. Saudi Arabia seems to be on a spree to mend broken ties. The First Nation is Lebanon. Relations between the two nations plunge to an all-time low after Lebanon's former information minister called the Yemen war futile. He even defended the Houthis, who are fighting the Saudi-led coalition. But after Kordahi's resignation and months of uneasy calm, things do look brighter for the Beirut-Riyadh relationship. Saudi Arabia once invested billions in Lebanon. It bolstered the country's economy and tourism industry. What Saudi Arabia did, the other Gulf states followed. They also poured in money to bolster Lebanon's industries. But the recent conflict meant that all those investments were cut off, not just from Riyadh, but several other Gulf states. Saudi Arabia was concerned about two things. One, the smuggling of illegal pills into the Gulf, and two, the growing influence of the Hezbollah. So the diplomatic crisis led to a blanket ban. No Lebanese exports were allowed in the kingdom. This further crippled Lebanon's industries that are already reeling from an unprecedented economic crisis. But now there seems to be a significant improvement. Saudi Arabia and Kuwait returned their ambassadors to Beirut, a move that slowly thaws the diplomatic crisis. Saudi ambassador hosted a dinner for Lebanese leaders, while Prime Minister Najib Mikati said he will visit Riyadh this month. However, the timing of Riyadh's rapprochement is not a coincidence. Lebanon will go to polls next month. Beirut has always seen an increase in foreign meddling ahead of polls. This especially as Saudi Arabia's key Sunni ally in Lebanon suspended his political career. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Saad Hariri announced his exit from politics in January leaving a massive vacuum in the country's Sunni leadership. But it's not just Lebanon that Riyadh is building bridges with. Turkey-Saudi relations are also staring at a massive reset. Over the last one year, Turkey has been on a massive diplomatic push. It is looking to normalize ties with the Gulf nations after years of animosity. But why now? This is because Turkey's economy is crumbling. The lira plunged to an all-time low against the dollar. Prices are soaring across the country, and Erdogan needs investments to save his premiership. Saudi-Turkey ties were marred due to multiple reasons. There was Turkey's support for the Muslim Brotherhood. It's a battle to become the leader of the Muslim world. And the last blow was the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, Erdogan blamed the Saudi government for carrying out the killing, even as the crown prince denied any involvement in the murder. This is the same Erdogan government that has now transferred Khashoggi's trial to Riyadh. This is because money speaks louder than morals.
The two countries could reach an agreement, turn the page and enter a new era in their relations, but the crime is the same and it has not changed at all. Even if there's an agreement, it should not have been handled in this way. Governments and states should have a principled approach. That's why the law exists and that's why it is important to resort to legal process. Erdogan needs investments and who better than Saudi Arabia? The Turkish president is all set to travel to the kingdom too, a visit that will likely take place during the holy month of Ramzan. For Turkey, this rapprochement is politically logical. More importantly, it is economically profitable, especially ahead of the presidential elections in January 2023. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. Gulf nations are embracing nuclear power. They say it is a move to transition from fossil fuels to cleaner energy. And the nations say it is for peaceful purposes. But why diversify with risky nuclear energy when there are other cheaper and safer alternatives? And could this lead to nuclear proliferation in the region? We bring you the story. The Gulf is going nuclear. More and more nations are interested in nuclear power. One of them even flicked the switch on a power plant. This is the UAE's Barak nuclear plant, the first of its kind in the Arab world. In Saudi Arabia, a nuclear research reactor is adding to talks. So why is the region embracing nuclear power suddenly? Nuclear power plants generate energy, but they do not add to global warming. Here's how it works. At the core, there is nuclear fission. Atoms split, they release energy. The energy boils water, which helps create steam. This steam then spins a turbine to generate electricity. Everything about this sounds simple, but this is expensive and very risky. Nuclear costs are enormous, but even if the petrodollars can help fund it, one cannot downplay the risks. If history is any indication, nuclear accidents can happen. When they do, they have deadly outcomes, both for humans as well as for the environment. For West Asia, those risks are even more diverse, given the uniqueness of the region. If an accident were to happen, there would be layers of implications. One, it could disrupt trade and gas revenues. Two, it could contaminate mission facilities and three could endanger the security of energy in the region. Currently, West Asia has two active nuclear power facilities. One is the Bushehr nuclear power plant in Iran and the other is the Baraka nuclear power plant in the UAE. Bushehr has one operational reactor, while the Baraka has two operational reactors. This means nuclear power development is still in its early stages here, but the Gulf nations are planning to ramp it up. They are using nuclear power to shift to a cleaner energy and meet their net zero emissions targets. But the same climate change could even damage the plants. Extreme heat waves could damage nuclear plants. Leaving behind radiation footprints, another deterrent could be regional rivalry. Nations can use one nuclear power program to build up the infrastructure, indicating that they could develop the capability for nuclear weapons. Nuclear energy could help with the global energy transition away. They can help countries move away from fossil fuels. But there is an inherent paradox with nuclear power. You don't know whether it will help you or damage you. The case is the same with West Asia. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. Qatar has opened its Olympic Museum with installations and objects showing the history of sports from chariot racing in ancient times to Formula One in the present. The treasured items in the Doha collection include boxer Muhammad Ali's gloves and driver Michael Schumacher's Ferrari. We tell you more. Muhammad Ali's boxing gloves, a Ferrari driven by Michael Schumacher and a shirt once worn by football legend Pele. Welcome to Qatar's 321 Olympic and Sports Museum, one of the world's largest sports museums. Its doors were opened this month by sporting celebrities and members of the Qatar royal family. The building is enveloped in five rings, referring to the Olympic symbol, of course, 
The museum has been built around the Khalifa International Stadium, the most famous of the eight venues which are hosting the World Cup. Uh, this museum specifically looks at both the Olympic and the sports uh, and how that, the intersection of that from a historical perspective but also from a Qatar perspective uh, and you don't find a lot of this in, in the region so it was very important for us to make sure that this legacy is set in place and is very understood how we fit in the timeline. One of the most imposing objects here is this Mesoamerican game hoop. It was used as a goal in a ball game played by people. It was part of the Mayan culture in Mexico in 600 AD. The game was said to be brutal and could sometimes precede rituals. Other installations take you further back in history, to the chariot races of ancient Rome, the first Olympic Games and archery from the Ottoman era. So we cover the ancient history of the Olympic Games and we bring it forward into the modern, allowing people to see how that transitioned into the movement that we see today, right? It's not a straight line, uh, so you'll have to come in to see where that gets picked up again. But we do want people to see that this is something that sport is in our past, it's in our present, and it's part of our future. Some of these items here are from recent history. Many will have special meaning for those who come here, like the boxing gloves used by 18-year-old Muhammad Ali. Jamaica's iconic bobsled from the 1988 Olympics is also here. In total, the museum showcases more than 17,000 pieces of sports memorabilia from across the world. There is even a whole room dedicated to torches, once ignited in previous Olympic Games. The museum also showcases different athletes playing up gender and racial parity of athletic achievements. We really wanted to bring something to the table where you could walk in and hopefully, no matter who you are, see a little piece of yourself reflected in one of the galleries. West Asia Bureau Beyond World is One. West Asia is not without its share of culture, beauty and oddities. In our next segment, Curiosities, we bring you some heartwarming stories from the on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay safe. I am Radhi Francis coming to you from Lebanon and you're watching Weon. World is one. One World Trade Center that is the one uh, where. Are you going to be there? Hmm? Gadi ki service kap se diva ya? Ye thodi jayenge kai. Ye to. Gadi ki service karwane ke liye kai jane ki zarurat nahi hai. Chill. Koi gadbad nahi hai. Go mechanic per pay, expert car services, 50 point inspection, or 3 mahine ki unconditional warranty. Download kare India ka number one car services app, Go Mechanic. Go Mechanic. Mujhe kabhi nahi lagta tha, log is match ko dek paayenge. 5G ki technology se, ye aap tak pahunch jayega, usko me shabdo me bayan nahi kar sakta. Bye. मैं यहाँ आपके सामने खड़ा हूँ या शायद हूँ ही नहीं। Every second the hologram stays on the stage. More than one gigabits per second of data is being pinged wirelessly. This is how people will watch sports in the future. 
कोई क्रिकेट को इस तरह भी देख पाएगा ये कभी सोचा नहीं था It's code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. Wildfires, floods, and hurricanes. Extreme climate events warn of impending doom. Is the world heading towards a climate catastrophe? Watch Weon's Climate Tracker weekdays at 12 p.m. GMT, 5:30 p.m. IST. How to fix the holes in our ozone layer. You don't know how to bring the salmon back up in a dead stream. You don't know how to bring back an animal now extinct. And you can't bring back the forest that once grew where there is now a desert. You have ignored us in the past and you will ignore us again. We have run out of excuses and we are running out of time. Show us your faithfulness. Show us your trustworthiness. Show us your honesty. Prove us wrong. We desperately need you to prove us wrong. God help us all if you fail to prove us wrong. God help us. One trillion species, 7.8 billion humans, 1.9 million species extinct, one planet. Where are we heading? What should we do? Watch Climate Tracker only on Wheel. World is one.